Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to lecture two and the Bob Dylanization of the PowerPoint process. What, um, what we're doing today, as I promised in the, um, the, at the end of the last lecture, was to, to look at the applied, um, well start to look at the applied process um, in the, um, the social structure, the notion around, well no, the facts of social structures, it's, it's not really a notion, um, and we'll look at, at, and then we'll look at social inter interaction. So we are really looking a, a bit at the agency structure debate that I was talking about at the end of the last one. Um, and I suppose the big social structure um, of the last few hundred years is industrialization industrialization because I just got a bit grand in my writing um, so the industrialization process um, th there are a lot of parallel events in the um, the 18th century there was the the enlightenment that I mentioned the industri the beginning of, of um, the industrialization process the um, what's called the industrial revolution um, so there was the intellectual revolution of the enlightenment the industrial revolution and a little peek to the next one ca capitalism which um, flowed on or followed followed on from from this process um, <clears throat> so if you if you you're thinking about social structures and the influence that they have on us us as individuals as members of society industrialization was and, and still is the big one to the extent that industrialization caused work to change now industrialization <coughs> excuse me um, I suppose the key thing was was the steam engine and Robert Louis Stevenson um, and flowing from from that then ultimately to to electricity so new forms of power new sources of energy then caused enormous amounts of changes in all sorts of processes apart from how we manufactured and produced stuff to um, how we lit our, our houses we could have fridges washing machines televisions all of that sort of consumer stuff that relied upon uh, the production of, of energy so but the industrialization process which started with steam and flowed quickly onto well relatively quickly in the time scale we're talking about flowed on to to electricity allowed uh, industry to set up in much larger way. Industry stopped being the <coughs> excuse me oh nearly out hang on this happens at the beginning of the the semester I talk for hours a day which is delightful for me um, <laughs> but my throat my throat gives up and it's already started today <coughs> The thing about industrialization is that factories were able to be set up. So industry moved from, from virtually the home, um, and if not the home, the, the small community, to big industrial processes, so moved to factories. So this centralization of work in factories was a key way that we as humans, as human society, had to then conform to a structure, to an expectation of, of, of a non-human form of, of social organisation. Um, so this, this form of industrial production became what we know, know as, as manufacturing, which, you know, if you're watching the news um, at the moment, is still a key determinant of life chances, of <laughs> Uh, chances for government and, and politicians um, and generally uh, manufacturing I mean manufacturing is particularly contentious these days as it moves from from the west to the east from the first world to to the the, the second world which is rapidly becoming the first world um, and this is this is constructing all sorts of um, um, 
social responses that we're that we're having to deal with um, and and the big thing sort of moving through the industrial revolution to the consolidation of, of these these industrial practices was moving from discrete production that was that w which was produced in the in and around the family home or in in the small community to mass production where we were producing in isolated sites, in factories, goods for people throughout a whole country, and which was sort of famously started by Henry Ford, and we'll talk about um, uh, his legacy um, in terms of, of uh, conceptualization of this process, um, which we call Fordism a bit later. But mass production was, was, was a key, radical, dramatic change um, in in how we organised ourselves socially. Um, and then the other interesting thing was the division of labour. Suddenly we were, we were asked to specialise, um, <clears throat> excuse me, specialise in, in factories so that rather than the, the, um, the family, the Macintosh family made the Macintosh shoe. So here we are at home, we've, we've grown the cows, um, we've tanned the leather, we've, we've made the soles, my, my sister weaved the laces, my brother stuck the last to the sole, um, my mother did the stitching around the shoe and my father took it to, to market. This was, this was the Macintosh shoe and we all had an input into it and we all may have changed around um, in these, this small time manufacturing process in response to sort of family needs and circumstances. The big shift and in, in the industrialization and the industrial revolution, the, the Macintosh shoe was taken away from the Macintoshes and it was sighted and placed in a factory. And we had no longer a livelihood because the factory could produce these things much cheaper and they put a monetary value on it. These may not have had a, a specific monetary value b before industrialization. They, they, may, they had a negotiated value. They also had an identity value. This was the Macintosh shoe. This was our identity. This, this, this to a certain extent, constructed us. Once the factory came along, we were buggered. So we had to go to the factory and we then, in this notion of division of labour, um, well, it, it, a micro version of the division of labour if you like, I become a cog in the, in the production line wheel. So I'm just sticking the sole to the last, sticking the sole to the last, sticking the sole to the last, and it's moving on down the production line. So, you know, specialisation is sort of dignifying this industrial process, um, but it does develop later on the notion of the division of labour. So we have uh, a division of labour that has a hierarchy about it as well. But if you think, so, that, that prior to industrialisation, we were producing this shoe, industrialisation comes along, and we're isolated to a, a, a minute process in the whole production process, you can see the, the sort of the, the impoverishment of, of our identity, the impoverishment of our value and our worth. This was an, an enormous challenge, an enormous change to, to how people conceived of themselves. And, you know, this isn't something that's happening historically. The digital revolution has done the same thing. If you, in just the last few weeks, you think about the number of people who've been sacked from large corporations like aluminium smelters, like airlines, like banks. These are all sackings. Uh, okay, I'll get a bit sociological imagination -y. Now, um, there are a number of factors that would cause these sackings not least the need that these organisations have for profit so they can distribute to the shareholders. Uh, it's about sort of um, uh, capitalist ideology where profit has become really important. But one of the other things in light of what I'm saying now is, is part of it's also the, the revolution, if you like, from the, the um, 
what do we call it? we'll say the analog to the digital so that the the workers aren't needed in the same numbers because jobs have been sort of compressed in the same way that you can compress things digitally they're compressed down um, so well compressed down they're just compressed aren't they um, compressed so that these people then become de uh, redundant and so we're going through a similar process now so this this process of the shoe to the to the factory then to the factory owner who then is walking away with these boxes of shoes and I'm turning around from my position on the production line watching watching the owner walk away with stuff that I've made and I know that he, because it would have been a he back then, think Dickens and top hats, um, he would be then putting a value on my labour, which is essentially my product, my family's product, and making a profit on that. You can understand how people were outraged, and this is also what, what Marx was theorising about, about how capitalism stripped dignity and stripped identity away from people. If you think of this process of, of taking that away from people, placing them um, in a factory situation where they had little choice about what they were going to do because their livelihood was, was taken away from them, and then the owner walks away with the product of our labour and is making a profit on it, you can understand the, 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 the potential for dissent. And if you think about bank workers today who are going to be walking out the front door knowing that the bank has made billions of dollars profit um, and the bosses are going to be walking away or driving away in their flash cars, you can understand how this, this notion of, of, sort of the, the unfair division of labour, if you like, um, uh, and as a, as a byproduct of, of a, a revolution, a change from one process to the next that has, has victims and those victims are human victims, then you can sort of understand what happened in the Industrial Revolution when, when the shift went from, from the home and the community to, to the factory. So that in terms of a social structure was a big change, a, a, an enormous change and like I said, one that we can, we can think about today. So. The Industrial Revolution introduced the idea of wage labour, that, that we were now going to be paid a wage for what we did. We didn't derive an identity, we didn't derive um, a sort of a whole, whole of life um, process out of what we did where we could, where our land, our homes, our food, our uh, relationships were all built around what we did and negotiated and traded. Our, our, our life narrowed relatively suddenly, you know, over a uh, hundred years or so, narrowed down to being sim a simple wage labourer where we were doing root routinized work, work that was repetitive um, and was, was necessary for the, the, the industrial process. So we had to conform in terms of our, our social organisation and our social practices. Um, we also, back then, had to conform our bodies. You know, our bodies had to work in with the industrial process. And this was, there was a bloke called F Frederick Winslow Taylor um, who came into the, the Ford factory and was, you know, he's, he's the white coat and the, the clipboard and the, the stopwatch. And so you've got this idea of time and motion studies where he's watching the worker put the, put the wheel on the car. And then he's asking, well, if you lifted up your leg like that and the wheel came through here and you could, could you put it on quicker? And if you could put it on quicker like that, then that's how we're going to do it. Because you had this, this notion that the, the process was much more important than the individual components. So that people had to not only conform their lives, but actually conform their body. They had to be sort of embodied, an embodied part of the the industrial process, in this case, say, the production line. And that's where, interestingly, where the, um, <clears throat> the idea of putting a spanner in the works came from. It came from reality. So the poor old bugger on the production line is being told by Frederick Winslow Taylor to start putting the wheels on like this. And after about 10 wheels, you're getting a pain in the back. So you reach behind and you grab the spanner and you go whack into the production line and it stops. 
and you get to take your leg down and stretch your body and have a rest while they discover what's caused the thing to stop. You might want to go over and sneak the spanner out before they got there to find out what, what it called. <sighs> don't know, just stopped. Thank God. Um, so <laughs> that, that form of social structure in, as embodied in the Industrial Revolution was what I was talking about the week before in how it, it has society and individuals conforming to, to its needs. Even bigger still, how did that happen? I must have channeled Karl Marx then. So I don't know how that's going, crossbones got there. Anyway, capitalism. <laughs> capitalism then, um, as, a, as a, an economic formation that, that then feeds down into a social formation um, or a social response that caused different forms of social formations was, was the other key thing. I mean, the interesting thing about industrialization and capitalism is that, that it really consolidated the, the way society, society was formed. And the nuclear family, um, you know, mum, dad and, and the kids living in isolation, although not a new form and not particularly caused by the Industrial Revolution or capitalism, was certainly consolidated by capitalism. So um, in, in so Australia's case, in 1907, we had a thing called the Harvester Judgment, which was an industrial relations, industrial court decision to pay a man, a man, a wage that allowed him to live in frugal comfort and support a wife and three children. So there was a wage rate that was determined at the behest of industrial and capitalist processes that caused the family unit to really consolidate as the nuclear family because it became the consumption unit. It became a discrete consumption unit because remember we're talking about mass production. Mass production then was producing all of this stuff. And you got all of this stuff being produced, people have got to buy it and there's no good having a, a, a social organisation where you had a, an extended family or a community that lived close together in maybe a number of different dwellings that could go and buy one lawnmower. So we'll go and buy one lawnmower, that's great, and we'll all share the lawnmower and use the lawnmower, or we'll have the communal telly, you know. Well, it sort of happened in my family. My grandparents had a television a long time before we did, and so we'd all go down and watch, watch the television. Yes, I'm that old. Go down and watch the television at Nan's place. Um, this doesn't work for capitalism, and it certainly doesn't work for, for mass production. So these processes then, then caused um, and necessarily so, um, there to be a wage determined for a family. Um, and although that, that you'd argue took care of the needs of five people, it also took care of the needs of, of capitalism as well. So you, and, and of course women <laughs> up until, well up until the 60s and into the 70s were receiving less wages than men. They were, they were expected to leave work if they got married or fell pregnant, depending on what uh, the institution was. And it really wasn't until in, in, into the 70s where women were starting to be able to work independently and support themselves without the social and financial expectation that they would be, be married early. So you can see how these processes cause us to, to be a particular way in society. And capitalism, um, one of the most powerful institutions and since you know, since 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell and communism effectively was defeated by capitalism because these were the black hat and white hat sort of guys fighting for for the frontier and and capitalism was the one that won until until that that time um, there was there was a possibility that we would have two organising systems. Now, I should say that, that communism made us conform no less to its structures and expectations than capitalism did, and some would argue, um, and, and any of those who, who lived through it would argue, probably more. The key thing is, from a sociological point of view, that all social structures 
um, ask us to conform to their needs rather than, than to our needs. But then we move on to, to the present day where we have <coughs> what some people call the post-industrial society um, supported or, or engendered by the, um, the digital revolution where we're no longer working in factories, we're no longer having to conform our bodies to, to the needs of the production line and we no longer have people standing over our, well, there's still a bit of that going, but we have robots working in, in factories now and, and you have human sort of robot interaction and um, there, there are still organisations where there's a very close eye kept on, on how you work, but we're working in a different way, maybe no less draconian way for, for some people, particularly if you're a, um, a call centre worker where it's difficult to go out and have a pee because of the needs of the... the, the post-industrial process. The, uh, this is um, characterised sometimes as, as the service economy and um, supported by the, the digital revolution in that we have all sorts of ways of, of contacting people and, and interacting with society. And <clears throat> this is what's called post-Fordism, as distinct from Fordism. So um, the um, the idea of Fordism, Henry Ford, you know, the car, you can have anyone, any car as long as it's black and Frederick Winslow Taylor and mass production, so you have the mass production of goods, so you've got to, you've got to change society so that, that it can afford to buy the goods. And so apart from the, the family stuff I was talking about, there are all sorts of other changes that had to be made to society to support um, mass production. We had to have just gives me more credit made available to people who the banks normally wouldn't give credit to. Um, you had to have you had the emergence of unions and and some sort of representative presence on the um, on the industrial floor on the the workshop floor. You had governments making legislation to oversee these processes. You had things like like health and safety. You had um, you had the development of of. Uh, credit and credit cards, you had, had mortgages, so you, you then had um, the development of, of suburbs and suburbanisation of the world. All of these things flowed out from the needs of, of mass production and, and the economy and capitalism more generally. What's happened now is that we've, the argument is, although we still do have, have um, a form of, of mass production, although it's, it's in much more discrete lots, and this is what they call post-Fordism. So whereas Henry Ford had the, the production line, a big warehouse down there with all the, all the parts, um, and then a big parking lot out there full of cars, um, post-Fordism is much more discreet. It, uh, it does things like just-in-time manufacturing, where you take the last axle out of the, the warehouse and that automatically orders the next one, so you don't have you don't have big stores of, of stuff anymore. Um, you might have teams working on producing. If we stick with the car metaphor, teams working on producing a whole car, so that we're not doing the Frederick Winslow Taylor putting the wheel on, and that's all we ever do. And then you'll have the these these cars will be researched. Um, for their target market markets within an inch of their lives so that you have the the Toyota Fluffy and they know that the Toyota Fluffy is going to go to a discrete group of 5,000 young women or the the Holden Butch which is going to go to a certain um, demographic cohort of, of young men or you may have the the aspirational cars that that are produced in in ways this is with the big manufacturers anyway. The, the more expensive ones tend to, to work on, on, a, on, a, on a, an elite market and don't have to tailor their cars so much because their elite nature is what distinguishes them. But in, in the, what was the mass manufacturing process, um, you get much more discreet demographic processes so they know that they can sell 5,000 Toyota Fluffies to a certain demographic which has a certain combination of things and they may not ever produce another Toyota Fluffy 
and the Toyota Fluffy may be a, a derivative of a Yaris or whatever it is, but there will be this discrete manufacturing that targets individuals. So you get this idea of individual consumption still in the context of, of mass production, um, but mass production sort of got smarter and moved with the times if you like, but it's also meant that, that you, you, you could target and be, be sort of assured of selling cars to a particular group in a time where you, you don't have broad community understanding about their position. Whereas when I was younger you had a Holden Standard, a Holden Special and a Holden Premier which was essentially the Holden working class, the Holden middle class and the Holden upper class. And that's all they had to do in the, the 50s, well, for, well, late 40s, 50s, 60s, um, and into the 70s when it started to shatter. That was the old industrial world, this is the new post-industrial world. And so that's, that's the notion of Fordism, mass production, essentially the same for everyone, to post-Fordism, discrete production for discrete groups. So this, there, that's, and there are other, other ways of describing it and other, other subtleties and applications in different parts of the, the sort of social world, but that gives you a, a sort of a general idea of what that shift from the industrial to the post-industrial is. So that's, that sort of captures, I hope, to some extent um, how social structures sort of bear down on us, if you like, and have us conforming to, to their needs. The other side of that, to a, to a certain extent, although it's, it's sort of not the, the direct opposite, is, is the notion of socialisation. How we, how we come to become who we are in the sort of the dynamic interchange between society. And there are, there are, there are a couple of people you, you'll need to know. Um, this, um, first off, uh, this Cooley bloke, um, um, Charles Horton Cooley, who talked about the social self um, and the way we, we construct our identity through society, and in particular what he, what, what he was using the idea of the looking glass self, um, and the idea, um, the idea of, of standing in front of a mirror and assessing how we, we're presenting ourselves is, is where he took the metaphor from. And so here's basically sort of three, three steps of, of, for understanding how we construct our, our social identity, that is, um, and using the looking glass self metaphor, is we imagine, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, we imagine how we appear we interpret others' reactions to how we imagine how we appear, and then we develop a self-concept on, on that basis. So we, we, we have an idea of what, we, what, what we're giving out in terms of who we are. Um, we then look at how people are re reacting to us to see how that's being interpreted in the social world, and then based on that we have a, 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 a sort of a self-concept. Now you can see how you can see how that that sort of dynamic interaction between us and society uh, allows us to sort of mould ourselves to a certain extent um, but it also it, it also there are, there may be fundamentals about our, our identity that don't shift so much so you can you can see that developing a self-concept we we would hope is appropriate to our social circumstances because that's going to give us the greatest amount of life chances the greatest amount of making friends um, dealing with the world in in sort of an appropriate sort of a self-supporting way, but you can see where being who you are and having a concept of who you are and then having society go, no, you're a bit too nerdy or a bit too this or a bit too that is going to be challenging to our social selves and, and the idea is that there's this dynamic sort of moving and shifting in order to to, to deal with, with those sort of expectations. There may be belligerent resistance there and then there, there may be, um, I suppose at the other end, um, 
a sort of a feigness or an uncertainty about about who we are with the consequent problems that that, that may develop but broadly what what Cooley's suggesting is that that we're we're assessing ourselves, looking out into the world to see what response we're getting and then adjusting um, our, our self-concept in order to, to deal with that as best we can. Um, I was going to have the Bob Dylan thing going on, which would have been a bit wanky really, wouldn't it, going on underneath, but we've got copyright. David won't let me because the copyright won't let me do this. So anyway, I'm reminding you that I'm, uh, you know, that one, uh, maybe you don't. Um, <coughs> the second one we're looking at is George Herbert Mead, who was a, a, a symbolic interactionist. He developed this notion of symbolic interactionism. And his notion was there was an I and me, and this is more a, sort of a self-regulating um, thing where <coughs> um, you had the notion of the I, which is the dynamic self, the, the responsive self, the, the personal self, if you like, and the me, who, was, who we thought we are and should be, and um, was the sort of more contextual person, the person who was, was being a university lecturer. And then the I, who can't help being silly. Oh, well, no, silly's a bit harsh, isn't it? Yeah, no, thank you, David. Um, but who is more responsive and dynamic, uh, and and who then sort of regulates to, um, to a, a certain extent the, um, um, the me. So there's, there's the, the, the me of university lecture and the I um, are in a sort of dynamic relationship. And um, this, uh, this symbolic interactionism was, was probably, I think, best characterised by a guy called Irving Goffman. And what Goffman did with symbolic interactionism was, was took it into what he called the dramaturgical model. And essentially that was, sorry, that's going to make a noise and annoy you and me. Um, <clears throat> Uh, essentially what Goffman said in this symbolic interactionist thing, which is not dissimilar to the, the, um, the first one we're talking about, the Cooley looking glass self, was that there was a front stage you and a backstage you. And it's, actually it's interesting doing this in my office because what I'll say is that, that when I'm standing up in front of um, the lecture hall, which is big, that's why I'm doing the arms, I've got all of these people there, from a dra dramaturgical point of view, from a symbolic interactionist point of view, I'm on the front stage. So I'm, I'm performing and conforming to the expectations of the context in which I find myself. So in the, in the lecture theatre, it's, it's much like a stage. You have an audience, you're taking feedback from the audience, you're watching how they're reacting, and you're constructing your performance around that. It's also done in a social context as well, so I also got the idea of exp social expectations. I'm a university lecturer, I'm a, I'm a doctor, so should I be more reserved and learned and slow and much more meaningful in my delivery? Or should I be more natural and be engaging and bring people in? Whatever that is, whatever that, that sort of social concept that I have about my role, and my understanding of the dynamics, that's the front stage. It's not, it's not, it's not the whole me. It's certainly a part of me, but it's not the whole me. Goffman argues that then there's a backstage, and why I say it's interesting is because I'll always say, well, what you see of me in the lecture theatre is not what you see of me in the office. And I'm in the office now, so I'm a bit conflicted. Um, so the idea that, that when I'm in my office or when I'm in the backstage, um, um, he, Goffman will, will argues that we're sort of recuperating from the front stage because it's, it's, it's a performance um, and that we're preparing to go back out into the world where we're, we're front stage. But the implication is that we're, we're more natural and more relaxed in the backstage. I need a park. Um, so I think the front stage, backstage understanding of symbolic interactionism works quite well because we all have a sort of a notional understanding about that. Whereas the I and me thing is, <coughs> excuse me, is a little more psychological and, and may, it's not psychological but it has that 
uh, component in that we're thinking about an I and a me and it's all happening internally, I think the better way of understanding it is front stage, backstage. We're out there performing, doing us, but doing us in the context of social expectations and, and, and the context of, of our our role, not our, uh, our our sort of personality. Well, our personality comes through, but it's it's mediated and modified by the expectations of the the front stage. Whereas the backstage is we're recuperating, recovering from it, being sort of more natural and, and sort of different from the performative person that that's on the front stage. Um, <coughs> so we're still talking about socialisation, how we become who we are. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, doing the Bob Dylan. Um, I'm going to have to stop referring to that, aren't I? Um, thank you, David, saying yes. Um, Socialisation is a lifelong process. So the the basic, the really sort of conservative. Well, sorry, um, there's a socialisation of emotions and socialisation uh, through gender. I'll come back to these, but I'll just talk a little bit about the, the process of socialisation. There is an understanding and there's sort of a conservative form of sociology, um, um, sort of theorised by a bloke called Talcott Parsons in the 50s, who um, is in that Emile Durkheim school of, of sociology, that sees socialisation as well, happening in a couple of stages particularly, what they call primary and secondary stages, uh, but it's about conforming to the surrounding social values and social norms of the time. So the idea is that you have primary socialisation which happens within the family where you learn um, to, to be a social being, where you learn you know, manners, where you learn the appropriateness of, of emotional expression, uh, where you learn about where um, um, mothers and fathers demonstrate appropriate responses, demonstrate heterosexuality. They were big on, on heterosexuality so that, that the child would observe, you know, when a man meets a woman and all that sort of stuff. And, and polite society and social expectations are reinforced. There's an instrumental role for men, that is men go out and act upon the world and there's a um, Okay, it's only taking the second lecture to get to this point where I go, what is that word? Um, and this is where I get to say, young people, don't take drugs, because this is what happens to you. Um, um, oh, what's the word? Don't stop, I'll, I'll get it before you have to put the camera on pause. Um, no, you're going to have to put the camera on pause, I'll be back in a sec. <laughs> it's expressive. <laughs> Men are instrumental, women are expressive. Um, so that men act upon the world, women are expressive, they're, they're emotional, they're nurturing. So this form of socialisation you can see is, is particularly narrow and conforms to a really sort of relatively narrow social view. So um, th this, this form of understanding socialisation um, in the primary and then the secondary, the secondary is then when you leave the family home, you uh, leave the immediate sort of um, uh, emotional um, you'd say nurturing environment and you go out, you know, you go to preschool or whatever you call that thing that you go to before school where you learn to share and not to hit the other kid and not to throw sand and do that sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> that's starting to sur surround you, uh, to uh, expose you to the surrounding social values um, and socialise you in, in, in the broader context of society. That's that's a way of thinking of it and it certainly has has truth about it because we are socialized by our families and we are socialized by our um uh social circumstances um it's not quite as narrow as as parsons was was indicating we understand now that the roles of men and women uh, are much different than that we understand now that that you don't have to have heterosexual couples bringing up children. Same-sex couples are equally as capable of bringing up children in a lovely, loving, positive um, environment in the same way that, that, that heterosexual couples bring up, bring up children. So you've, you need to expand out that socialisation process, but, but it's not to deny that those, those socialisation processes go on. But there's broader socialisation going on. So one of the key things is socialising emotions, is becoming um, 
becoming aware of what, what are appropriate emotional responses in, in the contexts that we find ourselves, you know, and, and again, you can see the evolution of, of it in the really banal thing about men crying, say. So when I was growing up, my father used to, my father used to get really upset if, if I was a big boy. I might have even been a teenager and I cried because he'd, he'd threatened me with inviting my mates in. What if your mate saw you crying? I don't care. Well, they'd care and you would if they were there because this is not a good thing for a boy to do. <laughs> All right. And so I became strong and masculine. Uh, <laughs> that, I suppose that still happens today, but, 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 but that socialising of emotions is, is an evolutionary process. But they're, they're still the understanding in a social context of what's appropriate and what's inappropriate uh, is part of the socialisation process and that goes on forever. Um, gender socialisation is, is the, the sort of the, the really interesting one I suppose, well no it's not, um, emotions, emotions, emotional socialisation is as interesting as gender socialisation um, and it's still subject to the, the same sort of uh, stereotypes where now okay what I should say and we'll do this in more detail when we do the gender week is that gender okay what's gender and you're going well that's whether you're a man or a woman no Gender isn't your bits. Gender isn't what, what you're born with biologically. Gender is the social construction of understanding what you're born with in terms of, of sexual organs. Um, your gender is your perception about what it is to be a man or a woman in the context of the society in which you live. So it's, it's, gender is about masculinity and femininity and to a certain extent it's on a bit of a scale but that scale is sort of mediated by acceptable gender practices, if you like, um, that, that society allows you to engage in. But, but the idea of gender is you perform your gender. You don't, you're not born with your gender. You don't have him or her between your legs and that makes you male or female in terms of gender. That may create your understanding of what it is to be a man or a woman, uh, but it's not what gender is. Gender is the dynamic expression of maleness and femaleness. And there will be certain aspects of me that will be more along the female line, certain aspects of me that will be more, more up the, the masculine end. Gender is, gender, uh, famous um, uh, feminist sociologist called Judith Butler, is performed. We, we perform our gender. Even if, if you look, if you watch how I, how I lecture and how I move, even though I'm sitting down, um, you will, you will have an interpretation of my gender, maybe unconsciously, but you'll have an interpretation of what I'm like in, in terms of my masculinity or my, my femininity, if you like, based on just how I use my body and how I express myself. These are all readings of gender. Now, um, in terms of socialisation, we, we're certainly socialised um, to, to have sort of appropriate expressions of gender. It's got looser nowadays, so I've known little boys who like to wear dresses and when they're little boys they get to go to school wearing dresses and nobody particularly cares. Um, up to a certain point. There is a certain point where people will start to care and start to worry and that's maybe a banal um, example, but this is the idea that, that we have expectations about what it is to be a man or a woman um, through our expression of our maleness or femaleness and uh, so that's 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 what we call gender socialization um, you've got any more oh, I do won't be a minute David sorry but Bob didn't have those sort of problem well he didn't he had just had cards didn't he um, but, but apparently they tell me there's another cardy thing on YouTube and so they're warning me don't do this because no one will know Bob Dylan but they'll all know this cancer kitty thing or something yeah David's going yes why do you know that and I don't I'm supposed to be the same I'm supposed to know all this sort of stuff um, okay so I've, I've sort of touched on touch on these things but but there there's a category where, where the, known as the agents of socialization and the primary agents of socialization as I indicated are the family are friends um, and institutions and society all of these all of these categories influence 
how we express who we are. Um, and all of them active in their particular way. Uh, you know, family, family can closely monitor how you're socialised, what you do. You know, the whole idea when you're a kid of using the knife, using the fork, um, putting them together when you finished a meal, saying please, saying thank you. That can be regulated strongly and regularly by the family. Um, friends may not do it directly, but friends will socialise you indirectly through if you like the mirroring of practices that we we talked about earlier and certainly institutions uh, like the family strongly in some cases socialize you into the you know you have lots of organizations that talk about our culture or what we do here or how we are here that's a part of the socialization process that's a part of conforming to their expectations of how you should be because to a certain extent you were owned by them in those hours from nine to five and so if you if you're dressing a particular way or you're acting a particular way that they don't approve of, they're going to expect you to conform, to socialise to their practices or consequences will be felt. So um, that's, that's a notion of socialisation. It's obviously much, it can be much more subtle and there's, there's much greater depth. But in the course of this last 30 minutes, I hope I've given you a, a, an idea a uh, taste of what it is to to engage in the understand the socialization process from a sociological point of view see you next week this has been a swinburne production